I don't know if you know that feeling if you sign up for a marathon or a half marathon. When you sign up, you think that's a really good idea. And as soon as you stand in the starting position, you are wondering, why did I do that to myself? And uh, I have a similar feeling today. But uh, let remind me and us why I think um, it's really important to talk about causality and why I think it's interesting. So causality in general, the idea is um, that we do something on the one end that affects then something on the other. So um, for example, if we change a certain variable in our system, um, that will have an effect of a different component in our system. And of course, if we manage our complex systems, there will be always those relationships that we cannot predict and that we will only get aware off if we encounter an incident. But we also have um, normally a, a system consisting of multiple services and all of them need to communicate together to provide the overall functionality. And actually that is something we can really track well. So we can see the causal relationship from the one service communication to the other. And as the title suggested already, we are talking exactly about that type of causality that we have from service to service invocation. Maybe another picture um, that comes to my mind, if we don't have causality, we have spaghetti and everyone knows spaghetti code. So the idea is something is very tangled and we don't see how things relate to each other. Um, well, now we know why it's important, but why do I think it's important and who am I? Uh, my name is Nele Lea Ullemann. Um, I work for Fiberplane. We build notebooks to collaboratively debug infrastructures, so you can bring in multiple uh, providers, um, observability providers, and see what's going on in your system. Um, besides, I love ice cream, and I've not always worked at Fiberplane. I joined this company almost a year ago, and before I worked for a company focusing more on process automation, microservice orchestration. And that switch for me was basically if we stay with a food picture coming from the main course to the dessert, focusing on something completely different. But if I see something new, I also look for similarities. And um, in the main, we have spaghetti, and I'm from Germany. In Germany, we also have a thing that's called spaghetti ice cream. Um, it's basically ice cream with strawberry sauce, but basically I found that we see causality not only in tools that are focusing on observability, but we also see causality in in tools, for example, like workflows. So mainly, in this next 20 or 25 minutes, uh, depending how much time we have, I will jump through those three tools, um, call graphs and service meshes, traces, um, and workflows, because all of them show us the causal relationship of service to service invocation. Um, let's maybe start with something where we could get something out of the box, because that normally sounds really good for us if we don't need to make that many changes. Who of you is running your services with a service mesh? Just hands up. Okay, I see few, <laughs> not, not all, but okay. So if you use a service mesh, the idea is it captures your network traffic and it helps you um, analyzing it and also helps you basically with setting up the network traffic. Um, and the idea is when we run in Kubernetes, we attach a sidecar to it and um, the sidecar then is responsible for handling the network traffic. And of course you can see if we have such a component, that might be a good idea to see what that can offer to us because it will capture already um, maybe the service to service relation that will happen over the network. You see here already I put an envoy, so the next example or the, the example we look at is actually Istio and Istio under the hood uses envoy as a proxy to proxy the network and um, yeah, on top basically what we also see in the, in the demo in a minute is Kiali, which is a plugin that helps us with the, with, uh, with the visualization. So let's do that quickly. I have here, um, well, I have here Kiali open and I see what I wanted to see. I'm basically here in the uh, call graph and I can zoom in. And now I see here basically the services calling other services. That's actually a causal relationship. So I see that the product page calls details and also calls reviews. I can even go uh, in into a certain thing and see here in the service um, what the relation is. The nice thing is as well in Kiali, I found is that we see this call chain activities compared with metrics. So if I go here on the uh, tracing page, I see here the milliseconds as metrics and this in context with the call chain that we have we can understand what or which kind of our calls took very long and which were very short, and I could go even deeper into one of them and uh, would get data here. I would see similar traces in that stack, uh, and I also see how many apps are involved. I also see how many um, 
spans are here, and I'm coming to that now because we are not talking here about a cold chain or anything else. We are talking here actually already about a trace. So what is a trace? Um, The idea of a trace is that I capture within a transaction multiple events, and each event is a, is a trace. It can be a call to a service, but it could be also um, a call to a database or a call to a message broker or any event that occurs. Every span has a certain duration and belongs to a trace, and I also know the parent span so I can basically conduct the tree down here. I already saw in Istio that Istio uses traces basically to, go, uh, to generate those call graphs. So um, coming back to the idea of getting something out of the box working, uh, where you see such a nice call graph if you use a service mesh, I think there is something you might and you want need to consider. The idea is in a service mesh, if I call service A from service B, I open the first span. So I have a context here. And once service B consumes the call, um, it knows the context from the header and knows they both belong into the same trace. But what then happened is, or what that can happen is, if in service B I call service C, um, I open a new trace. So I have two separate traces and I don't get the call graph out of the box. What I need to consider if I want to get a call chain with my activities is I need to consider basically context propagation of those, um, of those spans, of those headers. And that's something we can do, but I'm mentioning it here because if we are application developers, that would be something that happens in our code base, that we need to make sure that we propagate the context correctly. And by that I mean what is the important part here to link those different events to or different spans to one trace is actually the uh, trace parent ID. Um, that is part of the header that consists the trace ID and also the span parent ID. So here basically we know, okay, I belong to this trace and the, the previous span was the one that I have here as well. So that helps me to con uh, conduct the full, full chain. Cool. I talked about, um, or well, I, I talked about now the service mesh and how it helps us with the HTTP traffic. But if we consider our service architecture, we might not always have um, HTTP communication. We maybe also have other, other types of communication, maybe with a message broker. And then this looks different. Then also here we need to go into the application code to make sure that we trace those messages correctly. And then we are basically at the topic of tracing in general. So even without a service mesh, we can also start tracing our applications. The idea here is that if we have our application code, we can use auto-instrumentation. So there are certain agents we can also run next to our application code. So also no need to touch it. Open Telemetry has a lot of um, has a lot of languages it supports, and also within those agents, a lot of frameworks it supports. The other idea is, if I don't want to stay on the edges of my service, I also can go into the service code for manual instrumentation. I can make those events within the service visible in, in my trace. And um, yeah, let's have a look into a scenario here. And now we look into um, uh, an instrumented application with open telemetry and into Jaeger. And basically for that, I like to uh, introduce you to the context of the application I'm going to use here for that demo. It's an ice cream recommendation service because I really like ice cream. I have a hard time to choose. So we have four services connected over Kafka here um, as a message broker. And we have the recommendation service that takes a user input. And based on that user input, we need to call the location service to get the longitude and latitude of a certain city or location we, we, are, we want. And with that information, with the geodata, we can call the weather service, because obviously we want also our recommendation based on the weather. With the geodata, we get information about the weather. And then in the end, we call an AI service, because someone told me every good application nowadays needs AI. So we call basically ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT, hey, can you give me an ice cream recommendation um, for, for, well, I mean, we will see that for certain scenarios. Um, let's look, before we look into what ice cream we get recommended, let's look into the weather service. And I used here Micrometer in Java, 
Um, it is a facade that you can use with Java, and that's compatible with OpenTelemetry, so you can export the data in an open, uh, open telemetry um, standard. And um, what you see here is I use the observation API in code. I created an observation um, and started basically, and then I can control the life cycle of that observation. So I can create an event that will be the spam that we see. So I call it weather info created. And then I can give even further tags into that one. I can say I also want the weather, I want the business case, and I want the name of that person requesting this. And then I basically stop the observation. Another thing, if we are in the spring context, you not always need so many lines of code. If you um, register with aspects, you can also use an annotation basically saying um, over your class at weather fetched service. So not always, so there's not always a need to change so much in your code if you want to have custom spans. Cool. Let's have a look into the most important part, the ice cream uh, recommendation of the day. I have already my name. I'm in Paris. Uh, my diet obviously is croissant diet since I'm in Paris, and I'm still super excited to be here. Um, let's send that over. And it takes some time. Ah, well, it is here. And we have an excited mood. We have the diet preference. Scattered clouds in Paris. Can someone confirm? I haven't been outside. But uh, what caramel cappuccino ice cream flavor? That sounds not. That sounds not too bad. Let's look into what we can see now in Jaeger with the trays. If I go now to the uh, ice cream recommendation service, I see here basically the nine spans. And what I want to show basically is here that I have the weather consumed. Um, and I see here my name. I see the uh, scattered clouds. And I also see the business case. So I, I get all the information that I put there in the span. And that's basically the span that I've created. I also see the other one. Um, that is this one here. That is where we annotated the class. So here I didn't put anything. But based on the class, I also see the method I've called in that class. And that's basically the idea. If we want to have a causal relationship that goes beyond only the outside of the service edges, we can use the manual tracing to see what's going on in our service and how our service is behaving. Cool. Um, Jumping back to the presentation. Big question now. I haven't, like, just, just imagine, I haven't gotten an ice cream recommendation, and I'm a customer, and I'm calling the company responsible for that. Where is my ice cream recommendation? Will tracing help me really to find out what has happened if something has not been delivered in a, in a way? I mean, you saw clearly that I can put in the, bus uh, the business key and the business ID in a trace. But normally, on a best practice uh, level, we don't capture 100% of our traces. We want only 10%. We do sampling here um, because it's expensive to keep all, the, keep all the traces. So I must have been very lucky if this specific trace of my business case was, uh, would have been captured. So a trace not necessarily relates to a business case or to, to a process that goes through our, through our systems. And that's basically where workflows come in. And now we make a jump. We jump from the observability space more to the yeah, application designing phase and to workflows. So the idea of workflow is basically that I have a set of activities defined in a sequence, and I need to perform certain tasks. So for example, I write a shopping list, and once this is completed, I jump to the next step in the process, which in this case is an event. So in this example, I just wait for bank account balance uh, received, so I need some data here. And once I have that, I can order items, and then this workflow ends. And the idea is that those tasks can be performed by our services, and uh, those events can come from external. And that really helps us to capture um, business cases, because whenever I start one of those workflows, I create a process instance. And this process instance is, uh, is traveling through the process and also gives me information about state. Now, there is a certain benefits to that, because, for example, if everything went down or goes down, um, it's very easy um, to ask the state of the process, where are we, or where have we stopped, and where do we need to recontinue? Um, in our scenario, if we talk about the ice cream recommendation, um, we already have that one service, which was the recommendation service, that sent out geodata and received the recommendation. This one needed to make sure to correlate the messages correctly. So we already had some service with state here. And if we put that into a workflow now, we could say this is our workflow um, application. 
We have the set of activities that we do here. We request the geodata, we wait for geodata, we get the weather information, we request the final recommendation, so we call the AI service, and once we have that, we bring the information back to the front end. I'm still having Kafka here because it is not really important how you call certain activities in that workflow. It can be still over the message broker. It doesn't need to be direct service invocation. And that can be very handy if you have asynchronous communication and also things that maybe take a little bit longer. Um, cool. In the following scenario, I used um, DAPA as a workflow engine and as a, as a workflow uh, in my service because I saw it, I think, maybe last year during KubeCon and I was super intrigued by the idea to build workflows completely in code. So our workflow lives in the one service and we have the DAPA sidecars um, for, uh, also for, for the other abstraction layers uh, that DAPA uses and we can manage the state and Redis from that specific workflow. So how does it look like? Um, just give me a minute. So I have here the, um, the workflow defined in my application, the workflow definition, and, and the workflow definition in that service, I really define what I wanted to do. So for example, once I started the workflow, I want to send the location, uh, the location data, and here as well I have um, a nice way of separating the data only to the service that needs it. So with the location, um, object, I can define that I only want to bring uh, the name of the location in and maybe the workflow ID, but the rest of the information should not be passed to the location service. What I also can do is, um, if I have a well, and then here the most important part, I call that activity um, and I wait here until the activity has completed and then I continue in my workflow. Um, the nice part here is I can also wait for those external events, maybe coming from Kafka in my scenario, but could come from everywhere, right? So it could be also maybe a user that needs to do something. And if you have something really long running, because it, um, it uses the durable task, I can also set a timeout here. I can basically say, well, you know what, if this external event is not coming back within the next day, I actually, I do something else. In this case, I um, throw the task cancel exception and I define here in the catch uh, clause what I want to do. In this case, basically, I don't want to give an ice cream recommendation and I complete with something that we can't provide for that moment. And I think, I hope you already see that having this as a feature is really powerful because coding a timer in code can, can get really complicated. Cool, let's run the application quickly. So I need to... up this one here and I can bring up this guy that looks good and I go back to my to my front end I want to know the weather in Berlin maybe I'm missing out also feeling slightly more relaxed now to, towards the end of the presentation, so let's uh, send the data. I get French vanilla ice cream in Berlin. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know, well, okay, but I mean it did the job. So if I go here to the console, that's a, a thing I want to show is, I see what has happened in the workflow. I'm locking those events, so I'm seeing actually exactly what's going on. And based on that, this workflow has finished now, but if that would be a lo really long running business case, I could also query the workflow API to understand where I, where I am in the, in the current state. And also in the case of my missing ice cream recommendation, someone could look into that and really tell me uh, why the process and where the process is stacking at the moment. Cool. Um, That was a very uh, short and quick brief into causality. I showed basically three tools, not four. I think we saw they have similarities when it comes to the causal relationship, but then they are still very different from each other. Um, let's, let's have that as an overview. Basically, if we use a service mesh, we have um, the possibility to capture network traffic, and based on that also we see service-to-service -service invocation, um, mainly Mainly, they also use the concept of tracing here. Um, we might need to consider context propagation depending on which, uh, on, on which languages we use, but also uh, which codes we want to track. But normally, we only see the outer edges of our application. 
when we consider tracing, um, or well, tracing as, is part of call graphs, so they kind of are related to each other, but if we consider tracing, we have the possibility to auto or manually instrument our applications. We can customize the span definitions, so we can really dig into the context of the application and get more causal relationships of the, of the application insights. But also traces are part of the observability stack. If we consider workflows, um, that's why you see three lines, they are a little bit different because they are more or less uh, relevant if we consider business cases. We should consider them in the application design and build phase and um, they are also there for managing the state in our, in our processes, in our workflow instances. We can define timeouts and rollbacks and certain behavior, how we want the business causal relationship to continue. Well, with that, um, i like to finish. Um, I hope it shows you it's not of choosing the one or the other tool. You can mix and mingle, I guess. Um, it's only the different perspectives that we have if we look into causal relationships. Thank you.